Good morning, everyone, and uh, a very warm welcome to all of you who have joined us today as we chat with Wally Parsons on elevating road safety to a corporate and community priority. Now, our webinar presenter today is joining us all the way from London, um, where I'm sure you can appreciate it's very, very, very early in the morning. So um, a warm welcome to Paul, and thank you for your time in joining us at this uh, very uh, late hour for yourself. Now, this webinar is a part of the National Road Safety Partnership Program, or NRSPP, webinar series. And for those of you unaware, the NRSPP has been established to provide a collaborative network for Australian business and organisations to help them create a positive road safety culture, both internally and externally. It aims to help organisations of all sizes, across all sectors, to share and build road safety initiatives specific to their own workplace and beyond. It's delivered by ARB and funded primarily by a government coalition as well as ARB. For more information and tools like this webinar, please refer to the NRSPP website. Now, as I mentioned, ladies and gentlemen, our webinar presenter today, uh, representing Wally Parsons, is Paul Cook. Um, now, Paul is based in London, as I mentioned, and has over 25 years' experience in HSE, gained in industry sectors including oil and gas, mining, services, and FMCG. Paul has been with Wally Parsons for over eight years, having held uh, roles at a local, regional, as well as a global level, prior to taking up his current role in 2012. Now welcome Paul, and before I hand over to you, I'll just run through a few housekeeping items uh, for those uh, who haven't participated in our webinars before. Now we'll be uh, aiming for about 30 minutes presentation time, and we will be recording the, the webinar today, ladies and gentlemen, so there's no need to take notes frantically. All of the presentation material as well as the recording will be sent to you once the webinar has concluded. My name is Angela Juhas, and I'll be your webinar moderator today. So if you do experience any issues, ladies and gentlemen, please do uh, get those through to me and I will surely assist. Now I draw your attention to your control panel uh, where you will see a questions box and we ask that if you have questions for Paul along the way, please don't be shy, type them into that box and uh, I'll address them all at the end of the presentation. Now without further ado, I warmly welcome Paul Cook joining us from London. Paul, how are you going today? I'm doing well, thank you, uh, Angela, and thanks very much for that introduction, and, and thanks so much for everyone who's joined today and, uh, and giving me the opportunity to, to hear the Wally Parsons story on road safety, as it is so far, uh, bearing in mind that you know, we certainly understand we're only uh, you know, at pretty much at the start of our journey, but have made some, some good advances uh, in the early running. Um, maybe just to set the scene though, a little bit about Wally Parsons for those of you who don't know Wally Parsons. I, I know I certainly didn't when I joined eight years ago. Um, but Wally Parsons is a top 100 AXS uh, listed company uh, by market capitalisation. And, um, you know, we, we work primarily within the energy resources sector. So that's, you know, oil and gas mining, uh, power generation, infrastructure, uh, etc. And, and we're active across um, a lot of different phases of project development for many customers. So, so we, uh, we are active in the engineering area and of course, as you can see there, procurement, construction management and also our consulting and advisory services. We're, we're geographically uh, diverse, operating in 43 different countries across the world. Uh, currently, ha we have around 35,000 uh, employees but uh, I will say that we have many, many thousand more contractors who are very important in executing the work uh, that, that, we, uh, that we do. Um, uh, we, we have about a thousand vehicles or in excess of a thousand vehicles that, that are either uh, owned or, or leased by Worley Parsons. Um, but that would, I believe, understate the number of vehicles that we use and have access to markedly. Uh, we, we often use customer vehicles uh, and of course, uh, you know, hire vehicles, taxis, etc. So uh, we we are we are highly exposed to uh, road transport safety and and all that comes with it. Um, but really, today's webinar, what I what I really wanted to do was to uh, you know share with you, uh, as I said, um, you know, our journey and, and invite questions at the end of the webinar about uh, 
uh, areas that, that may may interest you. But uh, I guess to set the scene initially, um, you know, since certainly and, and before, but since I joined Wally Parsons eight years ago, uh, we've worked really quite hard on on health, safety, and environment. And our focus has been um, not solely, but largely uh, focused on the on uh, project establishment, uh, construction activities, uh, field activities that maybe uh, geo services and other other people like that do. Uh, we've been focused on how to um, share our values and get the same kind of uh, HSE performance from our contractors that we expected ourselves. And almost surprisingly, it really hasn't been until uh, the last couple of years that we've we've realised that we needed to dedicate um, a, a program and an, or an initiative specifically based on on uh, road safety, which uh, over the you know, the, the last few years, is, as we've uh, spread across the world, has actually become our number one safety risk. Um, so some of the ways that we've uh, done that is uh, is what I'll be speaking to uh, today. Uh, but but certainly one of the one of the underpin underpinning um, methodologies uh, is the uh, UN Decade of Action, and and we've um, we are signatories, and we we've. Um, adopted the five pillar approach uh, which seems to sit very well with with our organization and and really what uh, the webinar is about is is today is for for me to try and explain the uh, the approach we've taken in in framing our program around the five pillars and 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 also um, the, the the interesting blend we've had of uh, Trying to overlay a global uh, program um, that is still relevant in uh, in local communities and workplaces, um, and and I guess you know our, our story starts in a pretty sobering fashion, and and it was in uh, you know, the period of 2011 and 12 that that uh, we realised uh, and saw tragically, um, you know, uh, personnel killed in five different countries uh, around the world, and. And whilst some of these were not technically uh, work-related for the safety uh, professionals in the audience today who may uh, think in terms of statistics, these may have fallen slightly outside of our statistical boundaries, really made no difference because, uh, you know, this was a tragic loss of human life uh, of Wally Parsons people and that was simply unacceptable to, uh, to our people and our company. So our program started in earnest. Uh, when the CEO signed the UN Compact in April 2011, um, and, and you know it's not my role tonight to to explain in any great depth what the five pillars are. You can see them there, I hope, on your screen. But but what I will be doing is uh, talking about how Wally Parsons has been active and and uh, within each of the pillars, and and what we've done. Uh, and, and you know, just just you know, to re-emphasise um, what a good framework it has been for us to work from, not in not just in terms of what we've achieved internally, but but also in communication with our our stakeholders, such as our, our, our customer partners, um, industry associations, etc. Okay, so to to get into the uh, into the meat of it, uh, let's have a look at what we've been doing in terms of uh, implementing um, activities around each of the five pillars. So the first pillar, of course, is, is road safety management, and, and this is really where uh, we had to, to set out our stall and understand really what it was we expected from our operations uh, globally, not just Australia, but of course uh, wherever we operate around the world. And there were two key documents, and there were a lot of other uh, materials, guidelines, and and flyers and booklets and all sorts of things to promote uh, road safety have, have been developed. But two key documents were the business travel policy. Uh, being the type of organisation we are, we do have people travelling all around the place uh, on a daily on a daily basis. And and we realised that um, apart from what was happening within the, the normal locations that people work, we will certainly didn't have the controls we desired when, when people travelled. So we stipulated what we expected from uh, from hire cars, uh, behaviours and expectations around uh, taxis, uh, and, and very keen in, in countries where there is high risk amongst public transport 
to uh, ensure that our locations are vetted taxi or, or hire car providers so that we, we get the drivers uh, that we want in the vehicles that are acceptable to us. And we also uh, made it clear that our, our, uh, our personnel who travel for business were empowered um, to take the safety measures that they needed to take and, and uh, that, that, that may mean that they do not need to take the cheapest hire car available. In fact, we actively discourage that and apply the NCAP ratings to hire cars as well now. Um, but it's okay to send taxis away. Um, if you're uncertain, ring the loca local management group and find out what is the best way of uh, travelling before you before you leave. So a big a big emphasis was placed on on uh, our business travel, but far far uh, and away the biggest thing we did was we set out our uh, our objectives in the vehicle and driving standard. So. Uh, this was culturally a big change for us because it's one thing to have expectations, but when you write them down and mandate them, uh, working in a global organisation, there can be repercussions. Uh, it's not easy, and uh, and yet we, we we proceeded. So the kinds of things that were uh, that that were stipulated in our driving and uh, our vehicle and driving standard uh, were the type of vehicles. So we've with uh, mandated NCAP five-star rating vehicles for passenger vehicles and light commercial vehicles. Our journey ma management processes were uh, ingrained into the way we do business. Uh, it was, and I'll speak a little bit about that later, but uh, the locations in which we operate are around the world were allowed to do it differently, but uh, via risk assessment, we, we determined which journeys would need to be uh, monitored and, uh, and measured from start to finish. And, and which local journeys could fall under a blanket arrangement. So that was made clear. Our driver competency was, was absolutely key. And, uh, and also we established a set of nine key safe behaviours, which I will talk to uh, shortly. Um, Pillar 2 our, our, uh, you know, was really where we saw our, our uh, ability and um, uh, responsibility to, to put back something into the uh, the, the communities in which we uh, operate and we, we saw ourselves as relatively uniquely positioned in terms of the engineering and technological capability we have and expertise uh, to assist with, um, with, with uh, developing safer roads and, and there were some very simple examples uh, we were able to uh, influence the design of uh, pedestrian vehicle barriers on uh, uh, on city roads in, in places like uh, Sofia in Bulgaria, um, there were other examples that we, uh, you know, where we were involved in um, pedestrian safety uh, efforts in, in Australia, and uh, but far and away uh, our, uh, our our best example is the work we did with the IRAP organisation, which I will uh, come to towards the end of tonight's presentation. In terms of pillar three, I've already mentioned the fact that we've we've opted for. Uh, uh, five-star NCAP uh, rated vehicles, which uh, it sounds sensible and uh, eminently achievable in Australia, but you do, uh, and we did, uh, hit some hurdles in, in countries where uh, vehicles like that were either very uh, expensive or unavailable, um, or simply the concept of uh, NCAP five-star wasn't, uh, you know, it just wasn't understood or recognised. Uh, I feel that we've um, we've largely uh, got over those hurdles for the vehicles in it within, within our fleet. Um, some of the uh, exceptions or, or adaptions we need to made were, make was where you know the uh, NCAP program wasn't available in a certain country, then we would use another country's NCAP rating as long as we could establish it was in fact the same model and make of vehicle that uh, was under consideration. So. So we did have to make some uh, you know, adjustments along the way to, to make sure that people could do the work they needed to do. Another big one in terms of safer vehicles was in-vehicle monitoring systems. Uh, and again, we, we had to be quite clear about uh, what those uh, systems were capable of doing. And, and without being quite specific, we, we found that we were getting quite a large variation in what people were installing. So. Again, in some countries, uh, we asked them to install in-vehicle monitoring systems. What they did was install trackers, uh, which was really only one of many driving behaviour parameters we wanted to measure. So 
Uh, the specification was very important. We did uh, go down a path of attempting a uh, sole source provider. For us, it wasn't achievable. Uh, so, uh, as I mentioned, we stuck to the specification and allowed, allowed each location to uh, purchase um, uh, whatever device they needed as long as it could do the job that we asked it to do. I think um, in terms of safer road users, uh, this has probably been uh, the, the, the gem in our program today and we've got the, the most value out of developing what we've termed as the nine key safe behaviours. And um, yeah, I believe these have been quite pivotal in, in, our, in our success so far. Um, I guess what we recognise is we're such a diverse organisation, it's not possible to make um, you know, rules for every condition or circumstance that a driver uh, may find themselves in. We, we operate in, in snow in Canada and we operate in sand in Saudi Arabia. We operate on major freeways. We also operate in places where there are no roads at all. So we realised that um, there was something more than a, you know, than a, than a, a regulation or a procedure. We needed something that uh, got more to, to people's uh, hearts and minds. So we developed these nine key safe behaviours. And for many of you looking at the slide at the moment, you will probably recognise them and say, yep, they're all, they all look uh, pretty standard and lots of organisations have them. And indeed, lots of organisations do have them. Um, but I guess the trick has been um, getting these adopted globally. And uh, you know, they're, they're some of the, the, the challenges that we've had, which I'll, I'll talk to uh, in, in uh, a further slide in this pack. But, but just for now, I guess some of the things that, that jumped out at, at me as we tried to implement these were avoiding unnecessary travel. I mean, for those of uh, us who travel a lot, that sounds like a luxury, not a not a key safe behaviour. But um, you know, we, we are like most companies. We're very focused on our our customers. Um, we like FaceTime with them. We like FaceTime with our contractors uh, and all and all of our business partners, really. Um, but we had to sort of get our, our our operations and our company to take a step back and say, Hey, look, does this really need to be face to face? Um, do you really need to drive 300 kilometres? Uh, to have an hour meeting only to drive 300 kilometres back that same evening? Is there a way we can journey management, manage this better? But more importantly, do we really need to travel? And uh, whilst we don't have statistics on this at this stage, uh, my, my intuition is we do have people using a lot more um, uh, electronic means of communicating. It doesn't have to just be the phone, but um, you know, video conferences have, have taken root in our organisation now and, and seem to be uh, providing a good alternative in some circumstances to, to uh, road travel. Uh, not going through all of them, as I said, but some of the surprises we got was uh, around seatbelts. Uh, you, would, you would think, uh, you know, being from Australia, that seatbelts now are, are fairly routine and, and vehicles have them and people use them. Uh, certainly not the case in, in all of the places that we uh, we operate, um, and, and I, I I did say I wouldn't pick out any particular countries uh, this evening, but I, I will say that um, it is not uniform, uh, and that's where we had the tension of local culture uh, versus uh, what company expectations were, and I'll and I'll talk a little bit about how we've um, made some inroads into into making those uh, changes. Um, and I guess another one that's important for us is uh, a lot of the time we're not just drivers, we're passengers. And what we've done in, in our organisation is empower our people to implement in all of these uh, nine key safe behaviours. And, and that means as a, as a passenger you're not, you, you don't suddenly become mute and without a, uh, an opinion or any rights once you get in a vehicle. And we actively encourage uh, our people when they are travelling as passengers to talk to the driver about what their expectations are. Don't get in vehicles that look uh, unsafe and uh, you know, um, take ownership for their own safety when, when they're not the person behind the wheel. Um, and in terms of the, uh, the, the, the fourth pillar, uh, I think I, I also talked about uh, our, our training in terms of our, our training, we, we are currently focused on our business travellers. 
although our online training is available to our uh, um, anyone who does it for the company gets a, a free license for a member of the family, which is I think great. But uh, we do we do have um, training in I guess in two main guises. One is an online offering, so all business anyone who travels uh, for business or drives I should say for business. Um, is required to do our online training program. It is an off-the-shelf uh, product called uh, Alert Driving. There are there are others. We've found Alert uh, to be good in the time we've been using it. It is um, uh, you know what what the modern uh, experience of online training online training is these days. It's it's interactive. Uh, it has lots of video and it also has local content, which is important to us. So if you're in Lagos, Nigeria. And you're doing your hazard perception training for online, uh, on your online hazard perception training for driving. You see a Nigerian road. You don't see an Australian road or an American road, and and we're able to get that in all the all the uh, countries we operate. And that for us was has been a very good uh, thing. In terms of the content, there's really three parts to it. So it has a uh, a first part which uh, introduces our um, our people to the requirements of our standard. They then do the hazard perception training, and the results of that uh, automatically generates further modules on specific road risks that the driver uh, really needs to focus on. Um, and, and the final pillar, of course, is pillar five: our post-crash response. And, and and really, because we do work in some high-risk environments and, and have done for many years. We're actually relatively good at responding to crises. We have, uh, you know, uh, a group of people around the world, highly trained, who, who lead us in our crisis and uh, incident response. But of course, what they don't have is a crystal ball. And we've found the absolute key for us in, in terms of road safety is to know where people are. And certainly, in-vehicle monitoring systems uh, go a long way to to that, uh, where they're where they're uh, wired into. To, to live vehicle tracking, and we have that in a number of uh, locations around the world. But the whole journey management process has been key for us. And and by risk assessment, I mean we don't have journey management uh, uh, protocol for every single trip. And um, but it's not an arbitrary decision either. And we 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 do a, a, a macro level risk assessment, if you like, and from that we understand in a location by location project by uh, project scenario, which journeys really do need to be uh, the subject of um, journey management planning and which ones are just considered local uh, runaround journeys. And this has enabled us to know, to know for higher risk journeys where our people are. So this is again is an example of where we set a, a, a standard but we let each location work out the intricacies for themselves and they've managed to do it in a number of different ways. So. In some parts of the world, they're using a paper-based system. Um, they may have a journey management coordinator or several who are dedicated to do nothing but make sure people get from A to B in a safe fashion. Uh, but then there are other parts of the world where it's a, an intranet service, uh, and yet other parts of the world where there is a, a journey management planning uh, uh, provider or vendor where it's primarily done by telephone, uh, as I said, uh, an external provider. We have examples of that in uh, some of our major projects in, in Canada, for example. So where have we got to so far? Um, we we recognise we've still got a long way to go, and we'd be foolish if we thought uh, otherwise. But what we have seen since we started our program is a 36% a uh, reduction in uh, motor vehicle crash rate, which you know, which is good, uh, and and importantly, we've also seen significantly uh, fewer high potential road crashes. So we're seeing both a reduction in the overall number of crashes, uh, but we're also seeing a reduction in the potential severity of those uh, crashes. And and one of our challenges for the future also lies in these statistics, because if I were to show you a breakdown of you know, Woolley Parsons employees versus our contractors versus our joint venture partners, we're seeing that we've had perhaps predictably by far a greater impact on our own employees. So we've seen a, a quite impressive rate of decline of uh, road transport crashes amongst our people, but we have not transferred that same success yet 
to our contractors and, and that's part of uh, our focus for future programs and we're already throwing around ideas about how to get clearer specifications uh, into our tender documents for example and how to open up better dialogue with uh, our contractors and, and in many respects we take our lead from uh, one of our major customers, Shell, who are particularly good at this and, and you know, they, they've been terrific in helping us develop our program and, and one of the things I, I think it's well worth anyone on this call who is uh, uh, looking at implementing their program is do things like you're doing today and listen to webinars, go and talk to your, uh, you know, your, your industry peers for example and see what they're doing because really um, I was with Shell just last week in London and, and you know, again thank them for uh, you know they're pushing the boundaries out there, and we're we're gratefully following in their footsteps. It's a it's a huge advantage to have to partner with a, a company who are significantly more advanced in uh, road safety than, than we are right now. Um, final thing I'll say about uh, performance before I move on is we're also now seeing uh, a significant increase in the number of off-the-job incidents being reported. We do encourage that. Uh, it teaches us an awful lot about um, the road conditions and the types of hazards that our people are, are facing locally. So uh, we feel at the moment by seeing more reporting of off-the-job incidents uh, as a, a positive uh, affirmation that our program is, is gaining traction and, and people are listening. It also fits well with our future programs which will be faced more, uh, based more around a 24-7 a approach to road transport safety. We, we knew at the outset of this program we had to start somewhere and we chose to focus on our, on our uh, people who uh, drive for work or travel for work, but we recognise that it's a bigger picture, that, big picture than that. We need to look at uh, you know, family and community and, and uh, we, we believe made some good steps in, in, uh, down that track. You know, it hasn't all been plain sailing, that's for sure. And and I guess some of the, you know, I could I could probably talk to you for three hours about the challenges we've had, but I, I won't do that to you. Uh, so I'll keep it to a higher level. And and I've just sort of contemplated what have been our biggest challenges. And without doubt, the the communications uh, protocol has been the most important. Our, our, you know, we we thought we were clever, and you know, and it was important to have. Um, our systems and procedures and standards that most organisations have, uh, but quite frankly the nine key safe behaviours have been imminently more effective than, than all of those many pages. And, and the reason that is, is because they do transcend uh, language and they do transcend culture. Um, they're, they are, they're, they're easy to get uh, a, a communication about one of them or all of them out uh, and, and it, they, were, they were really um, pivotal in getting our executive buy-in. It was something that they could adopt quickly and easily and participate in. So, you know, we've made videos uh, explaining our key safe behaviours that have used our executive management. Equally, we've made um, videos uh, using local people. So, and, and people who have had personal experiences. So, uh, we, we've had people from Kazakhstan where you saw earlier we had a, you know, a, a tragic bus uh, fatality, uh, people in Trinidad who have had similar experiences, people who have had positive experiences uh, from Canada and Australia and Indonesia so we were able to, to pull together and include all of the different cultures and geographical uh, areas we work in uh, into the program which has um, added a little bit to its uh, success. Um, I mentioned at the start though, we, we do have this tension between uh, company culture and expectations versus local and this is where we found that whilst it's great to have executive uh, CEO involvement uh, preaching the message, they, they are, those kind of people are still very remote from day to day activities in a, in a far flung uh, country and that's where the local leadership are absolutely uh, pivotal that, that they engage. Uh, and they drive home the message uh, to, to their, their local people. The education process has been really important. Um, it seems odd, but uh, in some countries and cultures, uh, the wearing of the seatbelt is, is just a foreign concept and, and you really do need to take it from first principles and, and uh, you know, explain to people that wearing a seatbelt may be the difference between life and death. And, and sadly, we've had examples in, uh, in 
uh, various parts of the world where we've had uh, crew buses crash and quite literally those with seatbelts have lived and those uh, who haven't worn them have died and and uh, you know explaining the what's in it for me is has been absolutely key in, in local areas and, and I think also really importantly um, we've had to have consequences and that sounds a bit ominous they're not always bad in fact usually they're good and and uh, again in Kazakhstan we have a really um, uh, I think it's an impressive program of driver reward uh, program where based on the in-vehicle monitoring uh, statistics uh, the best drivers are rewarded. It's a small reward but it's but it's every month and it, and it maintains uh, maintenance in our program which is probably the, the final challenge that I wanted to mention today is, is maintaining um, that momentum in, in your program. Uh, I've already mentioned Shell who I think do a, a fantastic job of their road safety program. You know, they're more than 12 years into their program and they're still developing it. Uh, they're still looking for the next horizon and, uh, and you know, that's what we need to do. And, and Wally Parsons is probably known for, uh, for its entrepreneurial and innovative culture, which means people get bored with stuff really quite quickly. So, um, you know, we can't have the same road transport safety program next year as we had this year. Yes, we can't forget the principles, but we we have to keep moving and keep refreshing, and and um, it's just incredibly important for us, and I'm sure it is for the organisations that uh, other people are on on this uh, on this uh, webinar. In terms of, uh, I did say I wanted to come back to a, a good news story to sort of finish the the talking part of this and allow to open up to to any questions there may be, but. Um, you know, as I said, we, we've been largely focused on our, our business travellers uh, and our people who drive for, for work as a day-to-day -day activity, but we haven't forgotten it's a bigger picture and we do have a community focus. And, and this uh, particular uh, effort is, is one that I think is, um, you know, sits well with uh, you know, the, the sponsors of this webinar and, and generally what um, you know, Wally Parsons is about in terms of the broader community. But, in partnership with, with IRAP, uh, we were able to you know, take a look at their you know, well-respected, tested and internationally recognised road assessment process uh, and, and, and make some um, augmentations to that. So what we were able to do was transfer that concept uh, onto low-cost uh, tablets and by using some technology of GPS and cameras, we were able to get a, a, a tool which is pretty simple to use on an iPad or similar, um, could be used out in situ on the roads, and uh, it basically meant that uh, assessments could be done a lot more effectively and a lot uh, and a lot quicker. So, you know, we we beta tested the uh, devices and, and thought they worked pretty well. Then we went to a pilot in last year um, in South Africa. So, uh, you know, as sponsors of the the Road Safety Fund, uh, Safer Schools program. We thought we would take our, um, you know, the, the IRAP tool that we'd helped uh, augment uh, to South Africa, and we were able to successfully pilot the device um, in, around some schools in Cape Town. And you know, this gives us great hope because, uh, obviously, um, in South Africa, for those of you who've been there, uh, the roads are, are not at all the safest places that you'll find, but. There's a lot of them that need help, and obviously no government can afford to fix all roads at once. So this tool helps, uh, I think, enormously in allowing local uh, local governments to to profile their roads and make sure that they you know they spend wisely when they're when they're looking at their road transport safety budgets. So um, it's still early days, but for me it was a uh, you know a great initiative that that I think we can be proud of and something that looked beyond just our company employees but the uh, community in, in, that, in general. So that's a pretty quick run through uh, the Wally Parsons program as it currently stands and as I, I've said a couple of times now, we, we appreciate we're, we're uh, you know, only towards the start of the journey, not, not the end, but we've, we feel we've made a positive start and we're more than happy Sorry, to Paul, you've dropped down. out there for a second, but I will take Sorry. this uh, opportunity to have joined us today and uh, encourage you to send any questions through if you have any uh, for Paul and uh, we'll get those through to him. 
And I did want to mention at this point as well that uh, our webinar today, as well as many others, has been uh, sub uh, sponsored by Safe Work Australia and we thank them for their ongoing involvement and support of the NRSPP and our webinar program. So a big thank you to them. Now we have had a couple of questions and for, before I get to those I'd just like to uh, firstly thank you um, for sharing your story with us. Um, instigating change uh, and managing that change in any organisation is a mammoth effort and uh, I, I know that you know with anything I've, I've tried to do it's, uh, it's very difficult to get people on board even if the benefits are you know, quite obvious. Um, and we have had a lot of questions relating to the challenges that you've faced and, and how you've overcome those. Um, so could you tell us a little bit more about some of the, the biggest challenges and how you've overcome those? Sure. Well, I guess one of the things is we, we need to be honest with ourselves. Uh, we're, we're, everyone has seen what's happening with the oil price. Uh, you know, since the global financial crisis, money has been a paramount issue. So it would be foolhardy to pretend that even with such a, a critical program as road safety is that there's infinite funds available to deal with it. And one of the absolute critical parts of our program has been to demonstrate the value uh, that uh, our land, trans safe, uh, land transport uh, safety program can bring. And we had to be reasonably sophisticated in the way we did that. And it was probably something as HSE practitioners we didn't necessarily anticipate. So along with the, um, you know, the obvious preservation of human life, which is infinitely important, um, we were able to, to, to show environmental benefit, um, uh, running costs of vehicle benefit, and, and, and really um, having a rock solid uh, basis for the program to begin with uh, was a big challenge to get that accepted because we knew it was going to be a multi-million uh, dollar program and would be over over several years. So we, we certainly found that um, a challenge because without that you can't even get out of the gate, let's, let's be honest. Um, probably the biggest challenge we've got right now is um, influencing our contractors. As I mentioned, uh, you know, the Wally Parsons people, they work for you, they're obliged to follow your processes, although you know, it's not a big stick activity, it's more uh, an encouragement and uh, education communication program. But, but getting those people who are one step removed from us, our, our contractors, on board still is our biggest uh, challenge. And, and we're having some success. Um, but again, I, I think I've mentioned them a couple of times tonight. Uh, Shell, uh, by taking a leaf out of Shell's book, I mean, they are, they constantly have the door open. And, um, you know, I'm in, I'm in contact with their, their road safety Sorry, specialist. Just... Yeah. Sorry, I missed the end of that. Um, uh, I hope our audience did hear it though. Um, we had a little drop out there. Um, okay. I'll move to another question though. Um, this sure. is a, an interesting one. Um, there are some countries where finding good drivers with the HSC training experience mentality um, is difficult. Uh, some projects and companies do not allow expat driving outside the project site or even uh, sorry, um, or even at the site. How do you manage and balance this uh, condition or challenge? Yeah, we, we, we face exactly that. And basically we have a, a relatively sophisticated uh, risk management process that, that helps us decide that. Um, to, to be honest, we have um, really the, um, we make that decision most often, not exclusively, but most often uh, on security basis. And it's not so much that the drivers are incompetent to drive on roads, it's more um, the consequence of an, of an accident and uh, you know whether they'll be misappropriated by people who appear to be police officers. And, you know, there could be dire con consequences of being a novice in country. So, so we make that decision very early uh, in our mobilisation process around, yes, this is a place that cats can drive or, or no, it can't, but it's, a, it's not a blanket ban uh, by any means. So you know, if you're going to countries like uh, Australia, US, UK, you can certainly drive as an expat. Um, 
but you know Nigeria, Kazakhstan, uh, not so much. So it's it, to answer the question, we, we, we base it on uh, an assessment of risk at the project or location um, development onset. Great. And another question here from Peter. Thank you, Peter, for getting that through. So the question is, whilst the program is still evolving, in driving home the program and key uh, safe behaviours, has Wally Parsons addressed matters of non-compliance with staff and contractors? Yeah, we have. Um, and, and to be honest, we've, we've allowed that to evolve slightly differently in different jurisdictions, but but most um, most locations now are moving towards a, a, a just culture model. So it's a similar uh, method that, that, that uh, is used for other HSE non-discretions. It's, it's kind of based on James Reason's culpability model, whereby it's quite simply, um, you know, did the individual, how, how severe was the transgression and could, could you know, how much could the individual have done to prevent it? So we, we, we don't have a, a three strikes in your out approach whatsoever. It's uh, it's more, uh, as I mentioned, just just culture and how how culpable was the individual? How uh, how much were they able to influence the, the behaviour or the outcome? That it could be? Great, thank you for that question. And uh, David has a question as well. And David's asking, do you play an advocacy role for road safety with governments or civil society uh, organisations? Not, not really. I mean, we, we, we are involved through our corporate social responsibility uh, program, which is itself quite, quite new, um, with a few selected NGOs. Um, and, and we have a process by which those those are, uh, are are vetted and approved. There's only three or four themes that we currently have on the go in CSR, and road safety is is number one actually. Um, so so we we're active in some some areas, uh, but but I wouldn't say uh, overly so. All right, and a couple of um, great uh, little comments have come through here. Um, Jerome saying what a fantastic initiative Wally Parsons should be very proud great example of a corporate citizen so thank you for that comment and another comment here from Edward who said more of a comment I like the idea of organizations utilizing teleconferencing and video conferencing over long distance uh, travel to save on travel which I agree is a brilliant initiative And um, we, we have a question here that sort of relates to earlier on in the, the webinar when you were talking about the ANCAP uh, safety standards and so forth. So the question reads, do you, uh, you mentioned higher cars. Um, what was the ANCAP safety standard Wally Parsons expected and did this actually occur in the field? Yeah, it's, um, we, we initially started with uh, a four star rating. Um, you know, which is a pretty good standard of vehicle and you know, prevents a lot of uh, significant uh, injuries. But uh, we have moved it to five star as um, we, we found that, that vehicles were becoming, the five star vehicles were becoming more and more available. So what we did see in the early days was a, a real, um, a, a lack of uh, utility vehicles that were available in, in five star NCAP rating and that has has largely resolved. There's, there's a lot more of those vehicles now. So uh, yeah, we've, we've moved to five star NCAP rating and, and that's what we expect to see in the field and that's, uh, that's enshrined in our business travel policy. Excellent. Well, we might take one more question before we uh, finish up our webinar for today. And of course, um, uh, Paul's details are there on the screen in front of you and they'll be sent out in email also. So if questions do come to mind once the webinar has concluded, I'm sure Paul would be happy to hear from you and, and address those after the webinar. Um, one more question here. So this one's from Justin and it reads, you mentioned using telematics to reward drivers. What behaviour um, what behaviours are you looking for which um, you recognise? Yeah, really it's consistency across, uh, you know, the week, I think it is. We're measuring in Kazakhstan, for example, other other locations use uh, 
um, you know, different time periods, but uh, it's a combination of um, you know, not speeding, um, staying within geofencing areas where, where they're provided, uh, you know, harsh braking is measured, harsh acceleration is measured, and, and these parameters, I, I should add, this is where it gets a, a little technical and almost beyond me, uh, but we do set those parameters slightly differently based on uh, locations because those of you who have driven in Bangkok, for example, know that if you're not standing on your brakes pretty regularly, you're just going to go into the back of the car in front. So, so parameters are set, uh, I guess, what would you say? Yeah, the parameters are set uh, locally, um, but the, uh, the, the actual uh, style of driving we expect is, is, is global. So we will always measure harsh braking, harsh accelerating, speeding, uh, over revving of the engine and staying within geofencing where it's um, uh, where it's appropriate. So, right. so the, yeah, so they're the things that we, we we look to reward. And as I said, the rewards are are small, um, and and often I should also say uh, these all roll up into a monthly score. So uh, it's usually out of a hundred, and you know people who get between ninety eight and a hundred may get something and it might be something as small as a, a certificate. Uh, sometimes it's of no monetary value, it's just a, uh, they get their picture in the, uh, in, the, in the local newsletter shaking hands with the, the local director and that's, that's reward enough in, in many locations. Absolutely, I think um, you know just that acknowledgement is is definitely reward enough. That it doesn't have to be about you know a, an expensive gift or prize or anything like that. But um, yeah, just a, acknowledgement of that of that good behaviour. All right, Paul, I thank you so so very much for staying up late or rather into the early hours of the morning over there in London time uh, to, d to deliver this webinar for us and to share the Wally Parsons experience with our audience here today. And um, just uh, on that, once again, uh, our sponsor today uh, for today's webinar, as well as the other NRSPP webinars, is Safe Work Australia, and we thank them again also for their, uh, their working alongside us. If anyone does have any questions that we have uh, uh, run out of time to address today, please feel free to get in touch with us after the webinar, and I'm sure Paul would be uh, more than happy to chat with you thereafter. Thank you again, Paul, and thank you, everyone, for your time today. Hope you can join us for future webinars. Have a nice day.